Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, welcome to the service. Isn't it wonderful to have warmer temperatures and sunshine after all that rain? Amen. And not just the literal sunshine, but the real sunshine, the S-O-N shine. Amen. So, um, Pastor Rodney often says that he's very thankful and appreciative of people in his absence who can step up and help, and there are many people in this church like that, and uh, there's so many here this morning, but anyway, one of those couples is Bob Sharp and his wife Sue, and a little bit later, uh, Bob will be bringing the message. And there are many others, and maybe I'll touch on to that, too. Brandon, doing double duty, playing with us, setting up the sound system with Ted, and uh, there are others, too, that are really helping this morning. We all appreciate that. Okay, if you would stand with us, and we'll sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Oh, 
Yeah. 
Center. Um, I'd like to thank Mary Sharp. She made a special trip here this morning. Uh, ten of us were outside the church door waiting to get in. And uh, Mary brought a, could bring a key, and she actually did bring a key, but not too many people know the alarm system, so we had to have the right combination. Anyway, uh, thank you too. Uh, there were others, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Jim, Jim came as well, and uh, he was gonna let us in, but just prior to that, our most popular guy came, and that's Ted down in the sound room. He got a key and he knows the alarm and he let us in. Anyway, thank you guys. Okay, would you greet each other? Uh, we'll do a couple little songs that we all know. And then when the ushers or usherettes are finished uh, doing their, taking up the offering, would you get in position to take up the offering? Okay. So greet each other. God loves you I love you
five, Nathan. Yes, David. Well, great. That makes uh, me uh, sound better. I stumbled over the prayer for the offering. <laughs> Hopefully, I can get these announcements for you. <laughs> Basically, the announcements are found just as they are on your bulletin, but I would like to enlarge on one, and that's Wednesday night. And that's uh, our family night at 5 30. And uh, I tell you, I haven't been to family night. Like, the meals are tremendous. And uh, this week it's chicken, potatoes, rice, salad, and dessert. And it's provided by less than we need. So I imagine that's very good. But in the small print, and it shouldn't be, is uh, for the Bible study portion, we're going to be treated to super superintendent at Med from Chicken. He'll be sharing on the ministry of Gennett. And uh, we just saw this video of that as again. Uh, you don't have to come for supper if you're on special diets or something like that. But if you were there at 6 30, you wouldn't miss it. And the prayer time and the superintendent will be at 6 30. We just want to come for that. And I think that's all our announcements. The rest are in the bulletin. Everybody here can read, so we'll just leave it. About six months after we had moved here to Africa, we were going to a minister's conference in South Africa about 10 hours away. And we were going to stop in Durban about eight hours from here, be there a couple days on the weekend, and then head on uh, to the minister's conference. When we got to where we were staying in Durban, we got out of the vehicle and I looked and there was a trail of oil that uh, was on the driveway. And that did not look good. I got underneath and it was transmission fluid. It's Friday afternoon, everything is closed, and so uh, I looked up online and there happened to be a Hyundai dealership within two miles of where we had booked to stay. So Monday morning, I went down there first thing in the morning, they put the van up on a lift and they said, sure enough, what had happened was a, a transmission line, fluid line, had rubbed against the frame of the vehicle rubbed a hole in that line and all that fluid had drained out. It looked like a complete uh, new transmission job which was going to be very expensive. So we rented a vehicle, we went on to the minister's conference, they, they said we'll pull the transmission and we'll, see, we'll take a look and see what it looks like first. So they, they called me and they said uh, we pulled the transmission. It doesn't look like there is anything wrong with it. We think that if, you'll, if we can just put it back in and fill it with fluid, you'll be good to go. They said, if you would have gone just five more miles, you would have burnt up your transmission. We were praising the Lord because God knew exactly where we needed to be. And when we had booked where we were staying, we were only within a couple miles of a dealership that had all of the answers that we needed for when we were broken down that could help us with that transmission. This was one of those faith-building moments that became a faith-building monument in our life.
Okay, our next uh, song is a, a new praise and worship number, one that I really like and was so hoping we could do it. And thanks to Brandon, that's possible. And he's going to lead in Jesus Christ, my living hope.
We'll start at Then Came the Morning and finish the song out. <laughs>
Father, we're thankful for your presence here this morning, and we're thankful for everyone who has come, come into your house to worship you. Thank you, Lord. And we truly want our worship to be in spirit and in truth, inspired by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Father, you've seen the upraised hands this morning. They may indicate something very important to that person, something that it can't even speak out, Lord, and, but you know their hearts, you know our hearts, and pray that you will minister to all these needs, Lord. You know my needs, you know the needs of everyone here in your presence. Dear Lord, we lift up Pastor Rodney and Heather and uh, Les, I see that Elaine is here, but who are at conference, and we just pray for them, Lord, in this, I believe, last 
morning of the conference. We pray that it's been a wonderful conference, and we're so looking forward to hearing good reports when our pastor returns. God bless them. We, we think of uh, the new bishop of the Free Methodist Church. I believe her name is Reverend Linda Adams. And Lord, we just, as a congregation, want to lift up our new bishop to you in prayer as well, in every way. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> so, Father, I'm just uh, wondering what I've forgotten this morning. I'm bound to forget anything. <laughs> anyway, Lord, just thank you and praise you. And uh, we just ask that you'll be in the, continue to be in our service. And yes, that you will touch and bless Bob as he brings the message. And we just bring this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Oh, special music with Brandon and Karen at this time. <laughs> I forgot to tell Ken, we were all scrambling a little bit, I was scrambling a little bit this morning. Um, Marshall's kids all have the flu, so he texted me saying, can you fill in on sound? I was like, we'll make it work. So um, Karen's not singing, it's just me. We, were, we had a song ready for last week, and then there was two special music scheduled, so we are like, well, we'll just do it this week. And then as we were trying to figure it out this week, um, I was like, what if we try this song that I wrote like a long time ago? And we tried it, and it didn't really work as a duet. So she said, you should just sing that. Okay. <laughs> so this was a song I wrote um, a long time ago now. Um, and it uses the idea of home as this kind of centering metaphor. So you can think of it kind of like the prodigal son story, um, or home as like Jesus is kind of a way that I think of home a little bit. Jesus is my home, or the center that I come back to. And when I was young, I, I think I expected that my journey would just be kind of like a continual movement upwards. <laughs> and um, I expected there'd be like life challenges, but I didn't expect challenges in my faith. And that has been something that I've struggled with through the years of um, struggling with doubt and trying to fight through that and hoping it would go away and it doesn't. Um, and so there's days that I believe, and there's days that I don't. But I keep coming back to Jesus. Amen. Uh, Jesus is home. And so that's what I try to do. I try to keep coming back. And there's some days I do that better than others, <laughs> but I keep trying to come home. So let's give this a try.
references to that. And there's a lot of reading, especially for somebody like me. But uh, And usually I go to the end of the book. I don't know how many of you do that. Do you ever do that? Get halfway through a book and go to the end. Well, I did in, in these stories. And, I, and something really popped out to me. And I don't know whether it's because in, in Sunday school, adult Sunday school, we've been studying Revelation. And it deals a lot with prophecy. And I've begun to really enjoy prophecy. And how you look back, and many of the prophecies have been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you think of Christmas time, Easter time, and you go back to the Old Testament, and it was all prophesied years, years before it happened. And I love that. In fact, you can't understand Revelation until you learn to go back into the Old Testament and read some of the stories. Then you understand some of the allegories and the symbolisms and everything. And one of the things I look at today when you watch the news, you go read the Ezekiel War, if you will, Ezekiel 38 and 39, and you look at Israel, and you look at the history of Israel, and God says about Israel, and you read about the Battle of Gog and Magog and Persia and Damascus, they're all mentioned in there. And it is absolutely amazing. It's all written about God knew what was going to happen, and he still does. Fortunately for us, he's in control, not us. So that gives me a lot of uh, joy and helps my faith. But uh, we look at this, uh, these last words Jesus said, or second to last words anyway, the last words were, you know, and be able to go and be able to spirit. But he said, Aloy, Aloy, Lama Sabachthani. And that is Aramaic. And then uh, we'll get to that uh, maybe uh, slide two. Uh, in, uh, well, slide two, I'm going to, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> a couple weeks later, Pastor Rodney says, did anybody get anything out of that reading, remember? And some people say, oh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, God's love for us and stuff like that. And I said, all, oh, A-W-E. And I, he didn't ask me to explain it because he knows me too well. <laughs> and, uh, but I want to explain it today, why I'm in awe. Of this. Awe is a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear and wonder. You know, are you ever in awe of anything? Especially when it comes to the Lord. And it's 
especially when it comes to reading his word. Sometimes it's just, I don't know how to explain it, other than saying, wow, it's awesome. And in fact, if you look at the Old Testament, many, many people, when they saw an angel, they fall down on their face. They were so awestruck. And this is what I saw, if we go to uh, the, the, the next slide, in, in uh, Matthew. Matthew 27, it says, From noon until three in the afternoon, a darkness came over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is one of the few times in the Bible you'll see another language in there. In Germany, it's in English. And I don't know why the translators insisted on putting this. This is all in Aramaic, Aramaic right? The Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And in, okay, it's only mentioned in two Gospels. The other one's Mark. And it says, in, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if you look in the language here, you see the difference. The Eloi, instead of being Aramaic, it's Greek. Now, why did they do that? It must have meant something. And so that popped out at me. Well, so it means something. Okay, what does it mean? And it's only in two of the Gospels, Matthew and Mark. It's not in John and Luke. Why? You know, I'm not the kind of, I, I ask why a lot, I guess. And so I went into it, and I, and I look at, and I picture Jesus on the cross, if you will. Now, the picture we see of Jesus often, like that picture I had in the first slide there, uh, it's kind of nice. He looks kind of clean and, and everything. There's a little bit of blood, maybe, you know, from the uh, uh, wreath he's got on his head. But really, I don't think that's what he looked like at all. He was beaten up pretty bad. And if you read up on crucifixion, it wasn't. It was very, very ugly. And the person who got tortured and beaten up, by the time he got to the cross, he was barely alive. And there would have been blood, it would have been a mess. And in many ways, I'm glad people didn't put that up there, but it really strikes me as these crowds standing around watching this man God on the cross, and he cries out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And I, I look at that, and I don't know how many of you have talked to anybody that's in real pain, <laughs> or somebody that's dying. Oh, they'll cry out. And a lot of times you don't totally understand what they said. You gotta say, what did you just say? You know, because they're so stressed. And, and in fact, uh, so it came out, uh, only two people probably heard him there. And other people thought he was calling out for Elijah. Because he lied. And, and that sort of thing. So they thought he was calling for Elijah, which wasn't uncommon. A lot of people referred to the spirit of Elijah as someone to call for, for help. But it was significant. I looked at it and I thought, oh, he's going through a lot of pain and suffering for us. He didn't have to do it. And uh, this was a type of capital punishment, this crucifixion that the Romans invented. They didn't even do it to their own people. It was, it was not allowed to crucify a Roman citizen because it was so nasty. And yet uh, there's our, our Lord up there on the cross. So anyways, uh, and when he called out too, that was the other side of it, he, he said, my God, my God. Usually Jesus referred to God as his Father. You know, our Father, our, and he referred to the Father. In this case, he's talking to God. You can see how forsaken he really was, separated because of that sin. God the Father couldn't look on sin. So there's that separation, just like at the beginning when Eve and Adam, uh, Adam and Eve, <laughs> uh, committed the first sin. They were separated. And you've all seen that track where you have a man on one side of this cliff, and then there's this great chasm, and then God's over here, and in the middle there's sin. Separates us. Mm -hmm. Then you see the cross come in, mm -hmm. and, it, and it puts us in contact with God the Father. In the Old Testament, 
uh, we had, they had to have a high priest that would go into the holiest of holies, the inner of the temple. He was the only one to go in there. Go in there once a year and ask for forgiveness for the sins of his people. But then at the cross, what happened? Jesus became our high priest. That curtain that separated the inner inner inners from the rest of the temple was ripped, top to bottom. So we, because of the name of Jesus and what he did on the cross, we have direct access to God the Father. Amen. And that's where prayer comes in. And I, I gotta mention that you you uh, free Methodist. <laughs> I say that because I'm a free Methodist doctor. So. <laughs> but anyway, I was always uh, thrilled, and I go up to Van Acker quite often too, and by the prayer orders in the church. It's amazing, you know. That, that that's one thing about the Wesleyan. Uh, uh, what would you call it? I the Wesleyans do that. In fact, if you look at the revivals, the history, all these revivals, the Great Revival, all that Great Awakening, there is Wesleyan people, and they would, would pray, and God would bless people with a revival. So prayer is very important. Uh, Y'all seen this? It's an example. This in your bulletin, and you can just sign there and get on that list. Great. So anyway, we'll get into the Old Testament now, because... The other thing that led me to was Psalm 22. And I'm going to try and go through it in a hurry here. So bear with me. But Psalm 22 was written about a thousand years before Jesus went to the cross. It was written 600 years before anybody knew anything about crucifixion. Uh, and when you think about that, you read Psalm 22, and I'm going to go through it uh, maybe a little bit faster if I can. And uh, but go back home and read it by yourself and think of the cross where Jesus was. And and uh, it's a Psalm of David. It, it, it uh, starts off like that. It's a Psalm of David. You can go there in the Bibles in front of you if you want, because I don't have slides to uh, show it up on the screen. But it, it's entitled a Psalm of David. Now a lot of people think, well, this could be David. But really, when you read through it, because David did go through some times in his life where he felt maybe forsaken. I think that's a pretty strong word. But he felt that God wasn't answering his prayers, right? And I don't know about you, but sometimes we feel that way. The trouble with feeling that way is if it goes on long enough, we tend to, you know, think God's not listening to us. And we, we tend to fill in the blanks. You know, Job's buddies, they come from a long ways off. When Job was going through his tough time, when Satan was beating up on him, these three buddies of his came from a long ways off, and they tried to help him, but look what they did. They, they, uh, they hammered him big time. So we often, and then we come back, and we see how our, our prayers have been answered, and what a blessing that is. We learn from them. If uh, you, we, we go to... Uh, Oh, where am I now? What was the last one there? <laughs> Go for the next one and see what it is. Yeah, 2 Corinthians. Well, this is, well, okay, I, I was going to talk about Jesus. You know, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so, so that in him, in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a lot of scripture talking about Jesus. Next one. Jesus taught us how to pray. I mean, he prayed continuously, and even at times, you know, he felt, you know, and it says here, in the beginning, in be, being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. He prayed so bad, his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. What an example that is, how to pray. And, and we should be there too, if we go to uh, Isaiah 40, 31. Oh, okay, we'll go to Isaiah 40, 30, yeah, okay. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Now that hope there sometimes is, if we wait on the Lord, means the same thing basically. And this psalm, as we get into it, you'll see how we wait on the Lord. Sometimes we have to do that. And if we go to... Uh, uh, James 1, of course. I, mean, I often tell people if they're in trouble or if they're, you know, worried about something, 
consider it pure joy. We were sitting outside, we're going through this this morning on the way to some hill from the church. <laughs> consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind. Not that it was a trial, but because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Those are pretty strong words. And if we go into uh, Psalm 22, I'm just going to read it here. My God, my God. And, and think about Jesus now. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving so far, me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and I am not silent. You are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In your fathers put their trust. They trusted you and delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. And you, and in you, they trusted and were not disappointed. It says in verse 6, But I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men and despised by people. We, uh, uh, a worm is a pretty helpless little thing that crawls around. I mean, they, they don't really attack anything. It's a little hard to get out of the ground pounds when you're collecting two worms, but other than that, they're, you know, you step on them, they die. In fact, this word worm here, if you go back in the Hebrew, it refers to a scarlet worm. And a scarlet worm used to burrow into a tree just before it died. And, uh, and when it died, it would uh, secrete a, a red dye. In fact, they used that dye for their garments, but it would stain the wood. And that something worm, yeah, once again, and uh, scorn, okay, uh, and despised by the people. Do you recall that in the story of Jesus? Well, let's go to Matthew 27, 39 and 40. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. They mocked him. They, you know, they, they, they kind of made fun of him. But then, once again, uh, he, yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust you, my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. So he remembers. And, and, I, and I think this is good advice for all of us. We should remember. Paul used to say that all the time. Remember where you came from. You don't forget that. I mean, you, you don't have to get all cranked out of shape over it, but don't forget it. Because that's what God did for you. He brought you out of that world. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Once again, these bulls, if you go to Amos, you'll read where the bulls, the cows of Bashan, were the Jewish people that are around us. Roaring lions tearing in apparel from my uh, mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. This, you know, the crucifixion, when, when they hung there uh, on the cross, they their body collapsed, and a lot of times would be dislocation of the joints. In actual fact, they would, would die from asphyxiation because their lungs would collapse. It's like a tension pneumothorax, if you know what that means. From that but anyways, they would, uh, that's how they would die. And, uh, my, my strength is dried up like a posture, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You can imagine how thirsty he was. You all had dry mouths and that. Once again, that goes to the, uh, my, my thinking of him not being able to, even though he cried, though, it's not very clear. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me, and they have pierced my hands and my feet. This is why I don't think this is David. This is a messianic psalm referring to our Messiah on the cross. And it all came true. And the dogs, by the way, oftentimes the uh, Gentiles were referred to as dogs. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. John uh, 19. When soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four shares. One for each of them, with the undergarments remaining, and this garment was seamless, woven into one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. 
just as happened uh, that scripture might be fulfilled that said that divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. That's right out of Psalm 22. Isn't that something? And then he carries on with, uh, but you, my Lord, are not far off, O my strength, to come quickly to me. Then he says, I will declare your name uh, to my brothers. Go to Hebrews 11. Uh, the, there it says, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. Isn't that awesome? That we can be part of that family. When, when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, this is where we are. I'm just going to close now. It goes on. Uh, uh, the last of the psalm actually just describes who Christ is. And if we go to Philippians 1, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue, uh, oh boy, I'm getting mixed up with King Lincoln, James Lincoln. That, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. And uh, then I'm, I'm just gonna close here now with uh, John 3.16. Uh, I, I know we all love John 3.16. And uh, that's where we shall all be found. And uh, it's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that, oh, that, who, that whoever, I'm sorry, I, I want to think who's for Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. I always like to include that when I, when I uh, quote John 3.16. Because that last uh, chat, uh, verse uh, 18 is very important. So anyways, I just thought I'd share that with you and uh, share, uh, encourage you to look into prophecy. And when you see some of these stories on the news, just think about what's in here because it's all there. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I know, it, and I read the rest at the end of the book, right? <laughs> we all have, what a blessing that is. Father, I just uh, thank you for your word. And thank you for this morning that we have the opportunity to freely share from your book. And uh, I pray for those uh, around the world that, that don't have that opportunity. I just pray you bless them and gift them. And, and somehow, Lord, I, I just pray for our, our country. Uh, we know that uh, when you're taken out of schools and government, something's going to fill. And that's going to be another God. And uh, Father, we just pray our protection. Uh, from, from the evil one. Pray that uh, you would uh, draw people close to you and help them to obey all your commands. And we just uh, pray that when we leave here, people would see that hope that we have in us in everything we do and everything we say so that we might glorify Jesus our Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sorry, I went a little bit over. Have a good week.